The title of our message is called, When the Borders Change. We've been talking about the health uh, message, the history of the health message. Um, from the beginning, uh, we dealt with the um, time before the fall. And um, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible says that God um, laid before Adam and Eve a law, a commandment. Every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And because they broke that law, um, God added vegetables. Amen? Genesis 3 verse 18. But they didn't just break that law. They also broke the Ten Commandments. Because in the temptation in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 to 5... The temptation was, eat the forbidden fruit, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the solution that God provided for that is found in Genesis 3, verse 15. And God was speaking to the serpent, and he said that, um, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And then it, referring to her seed, it shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his what? His heel. Now talking about the coming of the Savior, the seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. It's the promise of the coming of the Savior. But Jesus Christ is going to be bruised in the heel, which is not a deadly blow. But he will put an end to the kingdom of the devil with a bruise on the head. Now face it, you get a baseball bat and you get two candidates, and you hit one on the head as hard as you can, and then you hit one on the heel as hard as you can, which one? Who, who's going to survive? Most likely. The heel. The worst, if you're super, super duper strong, the worst you could do to the heel, uh, you, could, you could get the heel so hurt that you might have to cut it off, right? Or that leg. But if you hit someone on the head... It's a definite deadly blow. And so the promise was, because of the breaking of the health law, God began on a move to expand the borders of the health laws as he sees fit based on the needs of the human race throughout the history as history progressed. Amen? And so we've seen that. He expanded it just after the flood. He expanded it um, uh, just after sin, and then he expanded it just after the flood. When Jesus Christ came on earth, he came in the days of Abraham, and he ate beef. And we know the reason is he ate beef within the borders that he had already laid down. And we know that in breaking the health laws, we break the what? The moral law. That principle is eternal. But it all depends upon... Borders and the principle of the health message, which is defilement. And the principle of defilement comes with a principle called expiry date. Because we're constantly getting old and getting sick, uh, anything that we consume, it doesn't matter whether it's meat or whether it's vegetarian or vegan, we can overeat a vegan diet and get sick. Wouldn't that be true? So it doesn't matter what it is, the defilement principle is the principle of the health message. And so, with that principle comes expiry date, because what God has allowed to be eaten, there is a time of expiry, everything expires because of the effect of sin. And so therefore, God opened the borders and opened the borders within the perimeters of those principles. Amen? And so when Jesus ate fish and gave it to his disciples... We know that based on those principles, the animals at that point in time did not defile the temple. Amen? The question now arises, when will the borders change? And if they do change, are they going to close or are they going to be expanded even more? That's the question. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 to 3, the disciples, they come up to Jesus after looking at this beautiful temple. And they said, well, the only way for this, this temple to be destroyed is at the time of the end of the world. 
And so they came up to Jesus and they asked him, Show us, Lord, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the what? And of the end of the world. And so Jesus goes through Matthew chapter 24. A lot of signs he gives. Because we're talking about eating and drinking, let's go right there to that particular sign. And the Bible tells me in Matthew chapter 24, if you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 down to verse 39, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. And then the Bible says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 24, he says, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the what? The coming of the Son of Man be. Now, I want you to have a look at a principle that is found in that verse. The principle is the characteristics of history is going to what? Repeat itself. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 15. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be has already been. That which hath been, that's the past tense. The past is now, and the future is has already happened. So in other words, history repeat itself. Caesar's not going to come back. But the characteristics that we see during the time of the reigns of the Roman Empire and the Papal Empire and so on, the characteristics of what occurred in the days of Lot, the days of Noah, those people aren't going to come back. They're already dead. But the character, human nature doesn't change. So as history progresses, hit, they, they, we tend to commit or do and repeat what those have done in the past. And so Jesus picks upon um, the, the characteristics of what happened in the past and he applies it to the future. Now we need to understand that because we need to apply it. The characteristics of what happened in the days of Adam and Eve as we see the broken law, we need to have a look very carefully that, and understand that the moral law and the health law, they were broken together. Amen? And for us to understand the health law in the last days, we've got to pick up on that principle. They always go together. And he mentions it in verse 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were what? Eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. It's interesting that Jesus combines the two. Do you see that? In the days of Noah, just like in the days of Adam and Eve, in the days of Noah, they broke the health law and they broke the moral law. And so it will be in the days of the return of Jesus Christ, just before the return of Jesus Christ, those two laws will be what? Will be broken. But... The Bible says, the result of the breaking of the health law, they knew not until the flood came and, and took them all the way. So when we're talking about eating and drinking, we already know that what you put into, into the body affects the, the mind. And um, in this particular case, Jesus is saying that there's going to be an epidemic, a health epidemic, a eating and drinking problem that is going to be a global problem. Just before the what? The return of Christ. This repeating in, um, uh, of history, I want you to put that in your minds because we're going to talk about the time frame of the three angels' messages. Now, I'm just going to quickly just tell you up front. The time of the expiry date of clean meat is the time of the proclamation of the three angels' message. All right? And I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible. The time of the expiry date of clean meat is the time when the three angels' message begins to be proclaimed. Now, I grew up in a church that was very, very 
fiery when we come to the presenting of the three angels' message. And I used to be interested in the beast, the mark of the beast, the antichrist. The... Now, we need to be interested in those. And I thought that the three angels' message was only about those prophecies. But little did I know that in the three angels' message is riddled with a health message. And you need to understand the unification of health law and moral law in the three angels' message. And when we understand that and all the other principles that we've been talking about, then we're going to see the borders identified in the three angels' message. Amen? All right. Now, let's continue. It affects the mind. What we eat. Now, I've got clips up here to show you, but... Um, I won't even venture into playing them because our system might, uh, we should do it? Okay. Now, if we're going to do it, how do I do it, my friend? <laughs> because it's on your computer. And uh, usually I know how to operate my computer. But if you're able to play it for me, it would be appreciated. Now, while, while Brother Peter is coming up to see what he can do with that, the point that I've been trying to lead you to is the Bible says, the Bible says, Jesus Christ says, that there's going to be an eating and drinking problem just before the coming of the Son of Man. Meaning... <clears throat> Meaning that the world is going to be engulfed with, you can say, maybe gluttony, <laughs> right? The food that is going to be produced by companies, the food that is going to be made available to humanity, uh, the, 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 the consumption of drinks, uh, liquids that will be available and made available to the world is going to be so dangerous that Jesus said, that it's going to affect the minds of the people, the inhabitants of the world, to a certain extent, to that extent, like in the days of Noah, that it's going to affect their what? Discerning powers. And as a result of that, like the days of Noah, the flood came and took them all away. Jesus Christ was going to, it will return, and we're not going to be saved. Now, we want to find out whether this verse, Matthew chapter 24, gives us the indication that the borders are going to be expanded or whether God is going to close the borders. Amen? Now, we know you've heard of uh, bird flu. Um, you've heard of the um, swine flu. <clears throat> you've also heard of this... Uh, 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 the diseases that are occurring to the fishes of the sea? Yes? What about the Hendra virus, the uh, disease that is uh, now infecting the horses and it could uh, end up onto the human being? And as a result of that, we might have a 57% of survival rate. <clears throat> have you heard of that? You haven't heard of that? All right. <clears throat> Go and do your study and find out a little bit more about it. Amen? Have you heard of the cows being mad? What, what's happening? What's, what's happening to the animal kingdom? They're becoming diseased just like wickedness increases in man. What's happening is you just take those pictures out of the way and imagine an apple that you just plucked out of the apple tree and then you leave it, leave it on, on the shelf somewhere or on the table for... A few months. And the apple begins to shrink and become shriveled like how we become when we what? Get a little bit older. What is that telling you? It's telling you that that is progressing on its way to expiry date. What is this telling us? It's telling us that the animal kingdom is sick. What is it telling us? It's telling me that they're, they're either expired or they're long expired and shouldn't be used anymore. But nevertheless, the Bible tells me, the Bible tells me there's going to be a problem in the world when it comes to eating and drinking in the last days. And I've used these examples of the animal kingdom so that we could um, follow our, our subject a little bit more closer. Amen? 
We want to find out whether this verse here in Matthew chapter 24 is telling me that because of this situation that Jesus knew very well, whether the borders, according to Christ, according to God the Father and the Holy Spirit, whether they are going to see and deem it fit to expand the borders even more and allow other things to be eaten, or based on the circumstances that they see in the future and that they see, they, they foresaw in the, from the past, that they're going to close the borders. What do you think? You think they're going to expand the borders a little bit more or they're going to close? Okay, at the moment, the weight of evidence tells me because of what we've just seen, common sense tells me based on the weight of evidence so far, he's going to what? He's going to close the borders. Let's continue. Does God provide a solution for this eating and drinking epidemic? Yes, he does. Let's go to Matthew 24, verse 14. What's the solution? Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Notice what the Bible says. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall what? And then shall the end come. Where is the solution? You see, God, Jesus, is not going to tell us there's going to be a problem with the food and the drink intake that the human race is going to have throughout the whole world. He's not going to just tell us and then leave it there without solution. Yeah? Amen. So he gives us the solution in the gospel. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Notice the identification marks of this gospel. First, all the world. For a witness unto what? All nations. Then shall the what? End come. So just before the end comes, just before the end comes, the Bible says, Jesus says, there's going to be an epidemic of what? What we eat and what we drink is going to be a problem worldwide. Yeah? Eating and drinking, marrying, giving marriage, and they knew not until the flood came. So what came after knowing not? The flood, destruction, the end. But then Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, just before the end, there's going to be a gospel proclaimed to all the world, to every nation. Then shall the end come. So logically, according to time frame, the solution to this problem is found in the gospel that is going to be presented to the world just before the end comes. Amen? So you can expect the health message that God is going to provide to his messengers to counteract that health problem just before the end. Amen? All right. And so far, we've seen evidence, the, evidence, the weight of evidence is that he's going to Close the borders. Revelation 14, verse 6. Now, we're very familiar with the three angels' message. The Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach where? To them that dwell on the earth. To what? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. To me. Jesus Christ, when he said Matthew 24, 14, he was referring to the three angels' message. The characteristics parallel. All the world, all nations, then show what? The end come. The everlasting gospel to, pre to be preached to them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then what happens? Revelation 15 says what? In this message, friends, the wrath of God, the, the free angel's message is to prepare the people so that we, in, in the last days, can be prepared so that we can escape the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? The seven last plagues and the second coming. That's the destruction. So the message that goes out to prepare the world just before destruction and the end of the world is what? The three angels' message. Amen? So, what we find out is, Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus was referring to the three angels' message. So, you can expect the health message in the three angels' message. Amen? Because that is the solution. That is the solution of this epidemic. It's in the three angels' message. Let's continue. Psalm 67, verse 1 and verse 2. How about we read together? God be merciful unto us and bless us 
and cause his face to shine upon us, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. God will have a saving health message among all nations. Characteristics, they fit. Amen? Now let's continue on. God has identified the problem, the solution, and its time frame. Let me ask you a question. When was the three angels' message? When did it begin to be preached? Hmm? 1843, 1844, right? So we've identified the time of the message. Yeah? And because we have identified the time of the message... Therefore, we can understand the time frame that Jesus is referring to in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, 37, 38, and 39. He's referring to that particular time frame from 1844 onwards. There's going to be a problem with consumption. There's going to be diseases. The animal kingdom are going to be sick. Amen? As a result of that, he's going to provide a health message from that time onwards for the world. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The solution is in the three angels' message. But not only that, we need to find out from the three angels' message whether the borders close or whether they open. Now let's continue on. The eating and drinking referred to by Christ is met by the give glory message. Now, we're going to go through the three angels' message. First, second, third. And what we want to do is we want to show you from the scriptures that in the three angels' messages, it gives you the indication of what borders God has given from 1844 onwards. All right? Let's continue. Revelation 14, verse 7. The Bible says, fear God and, and give glory. Now, what is give glory? If you have a look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, the Bible says, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which, what, which are whose? Which are God's. Now, this verse is in relationship to the context of the chapter, talking about not unifying your body to a, a what? Another woman that is not your wife. Amen. And that is within the context of the law. Amen? So, when we're talking about the give glory, we're talking about it in relationship to the law. Not only that. And that was the moral law, by the way. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And in verse 16. The Bible says... Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now defilement. You go back to Daniel 1 verse 8, and you'll find out the reason why Daniel didn't want to drink of the king's wine and uh, eat of the king's meat was because it defiles the what? Defiles the temple. In other words, Daniel lived by the principle of defilement. Not only that, you move right back to Leviticus 11. And verse 43 down to verse 44. Verse 42 to verse 44. And you'll find out that the reason why God said don't eat the flesh of swine, but eat the flesh of, 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 of the cows and so on. The reason why, because one defileth and one doesn't. Are we following? And that's all based on the principle of what? Expiry date. Amen? So, when we come down to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, we understand that the give glory message is twofold. First, body. Then, spirit. Now, if you go back to Exodus chapter 34... Exodus 33, verse 18, Moses said to, to God, show me thy glory. And God says what? I'm going to make you see my glory when I pass by. And when my name pass by, you're going to see my glory. And we find out in Exodus 34, verse 5, down to verse 8. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. 
keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins. But that will by no means clear the guilty. What is he referring to when he says, that will by no means clear the guilty? Where is he quoting from? Hmm? Exodus chapter 20. In other words, the character of the glory of God is talking about his character. Because when, when we're talking about merciful, we're talking about characteristics of a person. Yeah? So the give glory message, when we're talking about the give glory message in its spiritual application, we're talking about character, which is the law. When we're talking about it in the aspect of the body, we're talking about the law or the health law. And therefore, we must obey the health law to its principle, which is what? Defilement. Which Daniel lived, and which is the reason behind Leviticus chapter 11. He didn't give that law just to show how powerful he is. No. Any parent give instructions to their children because they love them. And it's not because of the instruction. It's because of the reason behind the instruction. And the reason behind the clean and unclean meat law is defilement. Amen? All right. You know, the Bible says, I forget the text out of my uh, top of my head, but if you eat a strangled beast... You'll defile yourself. What's the reason? Defilement. Amen? Now let's continue on. Now we've found out that the give glory message is twofold. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. It's showing us that the give glory message has to do with what? Eating and drinking, what you eat and drink. That's right. So, Jesus says in the last days, eating and drinking is going to be a problem. But then he said the solution is in the gospel. But this gospel is going to be preached out to the world just before the second coming. And we identify that gospel to be the three angels message. And then in the give glory message, there's eating and drinking message. So, the counteraction to that particular problem is in the give glory message. Amen? But it doesn't give me the borders. It just allows me to identify that within the three angels' message is a health message to counteract or help solve the problem in the last days. Moral and health law. The first angels' message, fear God, it's about the law. Give glory, it's about both law. The what? The health law and the moral law. The judgment message is about the law. Worship the creator is about the fourth commandment. It's about the law. Babylonian is fallen, is fallen message. Isaiah 29, 29 tells us that there are people that have been drunk and they're drunk, but they're not drunk with real wine. They're drunk with the precepts of men. And Jesus Christ quotes that verse in Mark 7, verse 7, and he applies it to the doctrines of men. Disregarding the commandments of God. So the second angel's message is about the law. Amen? The third angel's message is about the worship of the beast counteracting the worship of the creator. The image of the beast, the mark of the beast. So this is the laws of men versus the laws of God. So the three angel's message is about the law. But hey, it's not only about the moral law. The three angels' message is also about the what? The health law. What's the principle that I've just shown you? In the beginning at the fall, break the health law, break the moral law. Jesus says in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving you marriage. Nothing wrong with marrying and giving you marriage. Everything wrong with it if you broke the law. Connection between the law, moral law, and the health law. We come down to the three angels' message. Guess what? We have the moral law and the what? And the health law, the simple fact that in the three angels' message, the, it's riddled with the law of God, tells me that whenever the law of God is there, the health law is there. Amen? Based on the principle that we have just investigated into. Remember Exodus 15 verse uh, 26? Remember that? Keep my commandments and I will what? 
Put none of these diseases upon you. The connection between the moral law and the health law. So in the three angels' message, you have to expect the health law in the three angels' message. Amen? Amen. It's there. All right. Let's continue on. The weight of evidence so far show that the border restriction or, or the borders are going to be restricted and not what? And not expanded. Now the borders are clearly defined by the three angels messages position in the Elijah movement. Now these, this series that I'm doing, this subject I'm doing right now, it usually takes me two presentation if I really rush it or four presentation if I take my time. So I'm going to just because you all know the Bible, amen? People of the book, I'm just going to quickly show you something. You see, the time frame of the free angels' messages, it fits within a certain time of the Elijah movement. You see, John the Baptist, according to Jesus Christ in Matthew 11, verse 14, was who? Huh? He was the Elijah that was for to come. Now, the purpose of Elijah, or this particular gentleman, was to preach and bring the nation of Israel to what? Repentance and point them to Jesus. Now, I believe, this is what I believe, go and check me out after, amen? I believe that that was the beginning of the Elijah movement. Now, in order for you and I to understand the Elijah movement, we've got to understand the life of Elijah. And if you study 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 6, Elijah was, what was his first diet before he ran away for three and a half years? Huh? He ate flesh. He ate flesh. God fed him with meat. Ravens fed him with, with, with flesh. <clears throat> but if you have a look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1, 4, and 18, you see a changeover of his diet. Verse 18, is when Elijah met King Ahab, and King Ahab said, you're the trouble of Israel. And Elijah said, I'm not the trouble of Israel. You're the trouble of Israel. Why? Because you have forsaken the commandments of God. In that particular time frame of Elijah's ministry or life, of course, the commandments were now brought out of the what? Out of the bag. And that's the reason, that's the reason, and that, the, that was the message of Elijah at that point in time to the king of Israel. 1 Kings 18, verse 36 to verse 39. You have now Elijah on Mount Carmel. It was Jehovah versus Baal. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 5 to 6. It shows us the last diet Elijah had before he was taken to heaven alive. And that was angel food. Amen? Angel food, bread and water. And then Elijah what? Was translated alive to heaven. Now, the life of Elijah, the life of Elijah shows us the complete Elijah movement. And I believe it began in the days of John the Baptist. And then after John the Baptist, you've got Revelation chapter 12, the woman standing on the moon, her head crown of 12 stars, clothed with the sun, right? And that woman there in verse 1 and 2 represents the what? The Jewish church, because that woman was pregnant and was about to give birth to a son. Now, that son that was born is who? Jesus Christ. So, Jesus Christ was born through what church? 
the Jewish church. And that's the time of John the Baptist. And so what we find out is, in Revelation 12, verse 1 to 5, we have the birth of Christ, death of Christ, resurrection of Christ, and we also have the transition from the Jewish church to the what? To the apostolic church. Then you have in verse 6, Revelation 12, verse 6, the church fled into the wilderness for 1,260 prophetic days, which comes down to three and a half years. Wouldn't that be true? And during that time frame, what we have is in Ephesians, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, in Revelation chapter 12, you have the the church movement or the history of the church, which parallels Daniel 7. Daniel 7 talks about the Antichrist of Bible prophecy persecuting the church. Revelation 12 talks about the other side, which is the church fleeing from the Antichrist. All right? So what we have here is the 1,260 years. But in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, we also have the history of the church. But in seven phases. Revelation 12 is in three phases. All right, And we find out that in Revelation 2, verse 20, <clears throat> during the time frame of the church of Thyatira, which began in 538 AD, the existence of a woman by the name of who? Jezebel. 1,260 years, 538 to 1798. You see the parallels of this movement. Amen? And then when we come down to the time of Revelation 12, 17, the remnant church comes out, and the, what comes out of the bag now is the commandments. Are you following? Laodicea. A people being judged. You can't be judged without a law. So in other words, the law is coming out of the bag. Amen? And here in Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 3, where Laodicea comes out, is the time when Elijah, I believe, the parallel, when Elijah meets Ahab and he says, you're the trouble of Israel because you have forsaken the what? The commandments of God. And here is where Malachi applies. Yeah? You want to go there? Let's go. Book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, and in verse 5 and verse 6. Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, this particular time frame in the book of Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6 is very important. When we read the scriptures, we've got to identify the time frame. And we know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is the what? Is the seven last plagues and the second coming of Christ. It's in Zephaniah 1, connected to Daniel 11, 12, verse, 12, verse 1. And connected to Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 to 12, and Revelation 15, verse 1. The wrath of God, the day of trouble. And the Bible tells me that just before that time, Elijah's coming. But the Elijah movement had already existed from the days of John the Baptist. But there's emphasis on the coming of Elijah to uh, to bring the law back. Amen? Amen? Just before the grateful and dreadful day of the Lord. That is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. That is the Laodicean movement. Laodicea doesn't mean, um, you know, lukewarm, by the way. It's a people being judged. Judgment doesn't occur without a law. And so what we have here is the proclamation of the three angels' message. The law of God, the Sabbath, is manifested and is proclaimed throughout the world. And then later on, Elijah's going to have to stand on Mount Carmel. And what's the issue there? 
the Blue Sunday Law. As now Jehovah versus Baal and the sun god. But by that time, friends, Elijah is no longer being fed by meat. Amen? Elijah is now subsisting on the what? He's changed his diet. You parallel that with his life. And then when the persecutions are all set and done, Elijah, who's now the 144,000, translated without death. The Elijah movement. The Seventh-day Adventist movement, the Seventh-day Adventist church, and the movement, they have a special calling to uplift the law of God. But when you uplift the law of God, you're not only talking about the moral law, you're also talking about the restoration of the health law. They always go together. So according to this message, it's not only in the give glory message. The give glory message is an indication there's a health law in there. But the message itself, the Elijah movement itself, first, second, third, angel's message, those who proclaim that message are now going to live the life of Elijah at that particular time of the movement. And when we apply it to the life of Elijah, well, there you go. A border has been shown. And the border means that now we've got to move and close. Our God has closed the borders. And now we've got to go back to the what? Original diet. Amen? Yeah. All right. Let's continue. Weight of evidence say the borders have been restricted. The use of clean meat is no longer what? In use. Based on the life of Elijah. The life of Elijah is the life of those that live the three angels' message. Borders clearly defined by the sanctuary message. The hour of his judgment is come. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to use the principle that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 24. As in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus used the principle of history repeating itself. And what am I using? I'm using the same principle in the three angels' message. Because in the three angels' message, if we see that principle, we're going to know that there are stories that had happened in the past that are going to apply there. And it's going to give you the key of what borders God has now allowed. And by using the life of Elijah, yes. It applies to the three angels' message. The history there is now what? Applying now. History repeats itself. And as Elijah changed his diet, or God changed his diet, before his uh, taken to heaven alive, so were those within the what? The time frame of the three angels' message. And beyond, 144,000. I wonder why Jesus changed the Passover. Yeah? Because the 144,000... Do this in remembrance of me until the day I return. So the 144,000, somewhere, somehow, they're going to have the Passover, but it's not going to be meat. Amen? <laughs> All right. Now we're coming down from examining the message to examining a certain portion of the message, which is the what? The sanctuary. The hour of his judgment is, is come. Now we know that the Bible says, Psalm 77 verse 13, that way of God is where? It's in the sanctuary. Psalm 68, 24, they have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my King, where? In the sanctuary. So the plan of salvation is in the sanctuary. Now, we know Daniel 8 verse 14, what does it say? Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary... Be cleansed. And we know that date to be what year? October 22nd, 1844. Now, if we have a look at the sanctuary, we will see the same fulfillment when we have a look at the health message. In Leviticus 6, verse 24 to 26, I'm going to turn there. Let's turn there. Leviticus 6. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 24 down to verse 26. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron 
and to his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is what? It is most holy. So we know that in the sanctuary, there were sacrifices conducted on a daily basis. Right? You know, when they bring the lamb, it shows that they manifest faith in the promise of God, that the lamb of God is coming. So anyone that doesn't have a belief in the lamb or the promise of God, they're not going to bring the lamb. But those that are going to accept that promise, they're going to bring the lamb and they're going to slice the neck of the lamb, right? And so the lamb dies and the per per perpetrator lives. And so what happens is, remember on the daily service, they catch the blood and they take the blood where? Into the holy place and they sprinkle the what? The veil. But there's another way that they used to do in the past in order to take the what? The records of sins inside. What was that other way? The what? Exactly. The priest would eat the meat. And so as a result of that, that daily service, that was only the type, but the antitype is the what? Because every day, every day, the records of your sins will be taken into the what? Into the sanctuary. That was the daily service. But when it came down to the Day of Atonement, what happened? There would be a what? A cleansing of the, a cleansing, a cleansing of the sanctuary. Judgment Day. And so every day your records are there. God forgives, but he doesn't forget. <laughs> Amen? God forgives your sins, but he doesn't forget. There's a record up there in heaven. And so when it comes down to the Day of Atonement, that record is going to be what? Clean. And the sanctuary is going to be clean. And so what we have here is a direct, it, well, that was the type, but the anti-type is the what? The service of the heavenly sanctuary. But remember, when Jesus came down to earth, he died and he went to heaven and he went to the what? Most holy place or the holy place? Huh? Both? <laughs> he went into the holy place. We find that out in Revelation chapter 1. Right? He was among the what? Golden candlesticks? Amen? And which department of the sanctuary was that in? The holy place. Now, the type and the antitype, or the antitype shows us that the sanctuary service was in progress from the time Christ went up to heaven, right? Up until when? Up until when? 1844. Now, when it comes down to 1844, let's go to Leviticus 16, verse 29. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 29. When you get there, please say amen. Let's read together. And this shall be a statute forever unto you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls... And do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest shall make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So what we have here, the day of atonement, they were supposed to what? What are they supposed to do to themselves? They were supposed to afflict themselves. What does it mean by afflicting yourself? Like um, going on your knees on, on stairs and, and hope that... Uh, you graze your knees and get forgiven from the Lord? Huh? Let's go to Isaiah 58. Let's go to Isaiah 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. And let's have a look at verse 3. And verse 4. Isaiah 58 verse 3 and verse 4. What does it mean to afflict yourself? Afflict your soul. That, that occurred on the Day of Atonement. All right? So when, when the high priest what, is, is going, the people of Israel, they're afflicting themselves outside. The Bible says in verse 3 and 4, how about we read together? Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye you find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate. 
and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about fasting, isn't that right? But notice what it says in verse, verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted? This is what they're saying. And thou seest not. And then they repeat the same phrase again, but they give it a little bit more meaning to what they, or, or, or add, or tell us the meaning of what they're actually saying. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest what? No knowledge. So when, when they're saying that they're afflicting their souls, that what are they doing? They're fasting. So on the Day of Atonement, what were the people of God doing? They were fasting. Following? So somehow what we find out is, from the time Christ went up to heaven, the heavenly sanctuary operations were conducted up there by himself. And they were conducted up to a certain time frame in history. And then somehow, the people of God are to what? Are to fast. Or afflict themselves. But they are to begin to fast on the day that is called the day of what? Atonement. Now let me ask you a question. When did the day of atonement begin? Huh? October 22nd, 1844. So in other words, somehow in the sanctuary service, you have the fasting by the people of God from 1844 onwards. Now, if we all fasted without food, without water, we'd all be dead. There wouldn't be anyone to witness for the Lord. Amen? But what were they fasting on or fasting from? Now, if you have a look at Leviticus chapter 6, verse 24 to 26, you'll find that in the holy place, there was what? There was the eating of the what? Of the meat. Exodus 25 verse 33, there were almonds in this particular area. Exodus 28 verse 34, you had what? Pomegranate, pomegranate on the what? On the what? Amen. Exodus 25 verse 30 was what? There was showbread, the table of showbread. But when it comes down to the most holy place, something has been omitted. What has been omitted? What, what kind of food is not seen in there? The meat. So, we have not only to live a most holy place experience, but we've got to also have a most holy place diet. <laughs> Amen? That's part of the experience. And so, in the sanctuary message, from the beginning of the Day of Atonement, up until the second coming of Jesus Christ, it has given us the key to the borders of the health message. Amen? And the borders show us that God has restricted the health message or what we can eat and what we can drink and he's eliminated the what? The meat. The clean meat. You see the lesson when Israel came from Canaan to where? Uh, uh, Egypt to Canaan. What did they want? What did they want to eat? Huh? They wanted to eat the meat. Yeah? The food of Egypt. But they wanted to eat the meat. They were lusting after the meat. But what kind of food did God feed them? Manna. Manna. Manna from heaven. So in other words, when God gave them manna from heaven and they refused that food and they wanted and lusted after the meat and, and, and the food of Egypt, what did God do? Struck them down. You see, that lesson there applies from 1844 onwards. Why? Because in the most holy place, you have the manna. Amen? In the most holy place, in the ark... You have the manna. And in other words, God has given us an indication of the kind of food that he wants us to eat now. And he's eliminated the meat. And he's allowed us to see that we now need to fast from clean meat. Why? Because he now foresees that clean meat's expiry date has come. 1844. Amen? And so for those who do not afflict themselves, for those who reject still this health message and do not fast from clean meats, the Bible now brings in the lesson. 
When God fed them with manna, and they still lusted after the food of Egypt, then God is going to struck them down, just like how they, he, struck, he would struck someone down if they weren't ready for the Day of Atonement in the literal days. Cut off from the nation. You see how important the health message is? Salvational. Amen? The weight of evidence says the borders restrict the use of what? Of clean meat. Now, the borders are clearly defined by the second angel's message. Babylon is? Has fallen, has fallen. We know the story of Daniel. Taken prisoner. You know, they were taken in by Nebuchadnezzar to be trained in their universities and fed the king's meat. Daniel 1 verse 1 down to verse 4. Verse 5 down to verse 8. Let's read together. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and Mishael, and, uh, Meshach, and Azariah of Abednego. And Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not what? Defile himself. And we know the story. Now the people of God were under Babylonian jurisdiction, Babylonian religion, Babylonian educational system, and Babylonian diet. Hmm? So the Daniel diet and the principle of the defilement is found there in Daniel 1 verse 8. But the Bible says, now God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the, the eunuch. And so we know the story. Daniel wanted to, 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 to relieve himself from getting himself defiled by the food of Babylon. And by the way, the food that was given to the king was the best food available in Babylon. Yeah? It was the best that they could offer. You don't give the king McDonald's. Amen? <laughs> but nevertheless, the king received the best of the food of Babylon. But according to Daniel, it's going to what? Defile the temple. And so what we have is, he wanted pulse to eat and water to drink. Now what is pulse? Something sown that is a vegetable as food. To sow, a plant. So in other words, he wanted to leave the beautiful, enticing food of Babylon. And he wanted to what? Go back to the original diet. The original diet. <clears throat> Fruits, nuts, and grains. Isn't that beautiful? Vegetables. Praise the Lord. So the Daniel diet and the result was given by God and the Bible says he became and they became ten times what? Ten times wiser. I was talking to uh, one of my brothers here and um, we are talking about the health message. So if we disobey the health message, we'll become ten times what? Dumber. He said, he said ten times dumber. So I'll use that, that word, that phrase. Amen? Ten times dumber. So the Daniel diet and the results were given by God because of their faithfulness. The Bible says they were ten times what? Wiser. Now you could imagine. You could imagine. The church seems like it was about to what? To fall. According to the eyes of Satan, so much apostasy in the church and the leaders, they rise up and they fall, they rise up, they go into apostasy. And so Satan thought, well, I've got him. But the Bible says in Daniel 1 verse 1, it was God that gave Jehoiakim to who? Nebuchadnezzar. And then it says it was God that brought favor for Daniel to the prince of eunuch. And then the Bible says it was God that gave them the wisdom and it said it was God that gave Daniel the gift of prophecy. Amen? What was God trying to do? If you look at the background of the great controversy, what was he doing? What the nation couldn't do, a remnant did. He was setting up the three Hebrew boys, the four Hebrew boys. He was setting them up so that they could prepare, he could prepare them to witness to Nebuchadnezzar. So why do you think God gave Daniel, the gift of dreams. Why do you think he gave it to him? 
You could kind of like see his motive. What was his motive? He, what happened in Daniel 2? Hmm? What did he do to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2? He gave Dan, uh, Nebuchadnezzar the dream, and then what did he do? He took it off. Amen. God is in control. Amen. And so what we see, his movement, he relied heavily upon the faithfulness of these four Hebrew boys. And as the four Hebrew boys were so faithful to God, he now made his move. It's like a chess game. Satan thought, I've got the church. Yeah? Satan thought, I've got God's people. But God was moving behind the scenes. Amen? And so he now put the dream in, take it off, and then prepare the way to elevate Daniel. Amen? Prophecy alone couldn't convert Nebuchadnezzar. As we already had a listen to Musandola's presentation, he needed a cleansing program. Amen? He needed a divine uh, intervention. Divine pill. <clears throat> and of course, God is in control. The great controversy is being played out. He gave them the what? Knowledge, skill, and all learning and wisdom in verse 17. And these Hebrews, these Hebrews, their story is history being repeated today. You see, Babylon is on its way. From 1844 onwards, the three angels' message was proclaimed. But if you have a look at the second angel's message, Babylon was also making the nations drunk of its what? Wine. So in other words, from 1844 onwards, there was a competition. The competition is between two movements. Who's Babylon? Who's the mother Babylon? Hmm? The Roman Catholic Church, the, the, the system, the papacy. And then you have all the fallen churches, the Protestant fallen churches, the daughters of Babylon. So from 1844 onwards, two movements were what? Competing. God gave a message to the Seventh-day Adventist movement to proclaim. Expose the wine of Babylon. And then, but you had Babylon also on the move. Revelation 18 shows us who wins. <clears throat> yeah? Who wins? Hmm? By the time Revelation 18 kicks in, Babylon is winning. Because the Bible says an angel comes down from heaven and lightens the whole world. But before that angel comes down and lightens the whole world, what was the condition of the world? Darkness. Darkness because it has become the inhabitants or the house or the place of every foul spirit, cage of every unclean bird and de demons and devils. So what do we see now? Who's winning? The papacy is winning at the moment. That's the fact. We have to kind of like have camp meetings like this. Yeah, the papacy is winning. When God makes a move, when it comes to the time of the fulfillment of Revelation 18, friends, then the world is going to be lightened. Amen? But he needs you and I to be faithful or else we're not going to be lights of the world. We need to continue and hold on. The conference church is losing. It's losing the battle. Self-supporting is losing the battle. Why is it that when there is a football game, and if it was opposite to this uh, meeting, I can guarantee you that that place is going to be jam-packed. The All Blacks, Kamate. Yeah? And we have these Seventh-day Adventists self-supporting hard yaka, three angels message believers sitting in front of the screen. Oh yeah, go Tana Umanga! Right? Friends, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, not only those that commit these things are guilty, but those that love to watch these things. And so, don't be disheartened. We're going to win. Amen? God is going to win. But at the moment, the papacy is winning. If anyone wants to go with Evan over to America, give him a call. 
go and stir it up over there a little bit and, and, and keep the tide to a certain level. Amen? Sorry, I can't come. I'm, I'm doing an evangelistic meeting. But what is the significance of this history for us today? What's the significance? We know God gave the gift of prophecy, the rise of Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, pagan Rome was explained to Nebuchadnezzar, second coming of Christ, and his kingdom was explained to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, he accepted for a little while. Now, how did God use Daniel's three friends? Because self rose up again. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. He bowed down before a servant and, and a slave, and then, you know, self rose again. And so God used who? The other three Hebrew boys. And we know the story. There was false worship. And the three Hebrew boys, they were faithful to God's commandment and to God. The laws of the land are now passed. New Zealand is now forbidding Seventh-day Adventists to worship on the Sabbath, on the pain of death. Right? You now have to, uh, are commanded to worship the, the image of the beast and, and, and the mark of the beast. Sunday law is being enforced. Elijah is now standing on Mount Carmel. And what did the three Hebrew boys do they did not bow what's the point that history those three Hebrew boys is a representation of those who live under the three angels message what's the point the point is in the three angels message the third angels message that the, the beast the papacy, the image of the beast, and the what? And the mark of the beast. In the third angel's message, you have the image. But from the second angel, we learn, we learn that they needed to pass the diet test so they can understand prophecy, so they can stand before kings, so they can stand and survive the image. Do you hear what I just said? In the three angel's message... You've got give glory. It's about eating and drinking. You've got Elijah, changing of your diet. You've got the sanctuary message, changing of your diet. You've got the Babylonian message, changing of your diet. They're all consistent. Elijah changed from meat to vegetarianism. Yeah? The sanctuary message in the most holy place, changing from meat. The meat is now left out and you have to fast from meat. Because it's not in the most holy place. Diet. The second angel's message, Daniel had to come back and leave the meat and eat the what? The original diet. It gives us specifically the borders in the first and second angel's message in order for us to survive the third angel. Very important. So the borders are laid out in the three angel's message. You can't escape it. It's there. Amen? Amen? Now, for final confirmation on, on God, uh, God sends a what? A prophet. And guess when, when God decides to, to raise up this prophet? Around 1844. How about that? Expiry date is 1844. And so the spirit of prophecy says, Again and again I have, seen, I have been shown... That God is trying to lead us back step by step to his original design. That man should subsist upon the natural products of the earth. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be done away. Flesh will cease to form a part of their diet. We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily towards it. I cannot think that in the practice of flesh eating, we are in harmony with the light which God had been pleased to give us. Also, all, all who are connected with our health institution especially should be educating themselves to subsist on fruits, grains, and vegetables. If we move from principle in these things, if we as Christians reformers educate our own, our own taste and bring our diet to what? God's plan. Then we may exert an influence upon others in this matter which will be pleasing to God. It began off with God's plan and now we're ending with God's plan. Amen? Expired. 
Meat eating should not come into the pre prescription for any invalid invalids, from any physicians, from among those who understand these things. Disease in cattle is making meat eating a dangerous matter. The Lord's curse is upon the earth, upon man, upon beasts, upon the fish in the sea. And as the transgressions become almost in universal, the curse will be permitted to become as broad and as deep as the transgression. Disease is contracted by the use of meat. The diseased flesh of these dead carcasses is sold in the marketplaces and disease among men is the sure result. What am I trying to show you? The date of expiry. Amen? Matthew 24, it doesn't give us any indication that God is going to expand the borders. It gives us an indication that he's going to what? He's going to close the borders. Give glory directly applies or is an answer to the eating and drinking. Because whether therefore you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the what? Glory of God. Give glory gives us an indication that there is a health message in the what? In the three angels' message. The three angels' message itself shows us that it's heavily to do with the law. And whenever the law of God is there, the health law is there. You cannot separate the two. But what you have to do is, you have to find out which borders. Are we following? What borders are the health law in that particular time? And then we find out the Elijah message. At that time, Elijah's changed his diet. We found out the sanctuary message at that time from 1844 onwards. We're now living the diet in the most holy place. We find out in Daniel's diet, all these three, four, five confirmation, it's telling us the borders of the health message. And then God decides to raise up a prophet to confirm it all. How about that? It's in the three angels' message. Amen? It's there. Jesus is trying to point his people to the path where we should go. He's trying to guide us back home. And so Jesus is asking, come unto me. Amen? And if you're still not satisfied with what Jesus is saying, in Job chapter 12, it says, ask the beast of the field. And the cow will say, I'm mad at you. The birds will say, I've got the flu. Yeah? The swine says to the Seventh-day Adventists, you shouldn't be eating me anyway, but if you decide to, I've also got the flu. And the horses are sick. The fish of the sea is sick. The animal kingdom is saying, please, enough of eating me. I'm expired. And so, friends, that's our message this afternoon. And I wanted to make sure that um, because I had to run through these presentation or else so we wouldn't get out of here. But I hope you can go back and think about it, study it out for yourself. But the law of health always go together with the Ten Commandments. And understanding the principles, you would understand the border changes throughout the history of the world. But now God is trying to lead us back so that we can go, go home. Amen? Amen? Who would like to accept um, the message this uh, afternoon? Okay. Praise the Lord. Let us have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, our loving, merciful Savior, in the blessed, precious name of Jesus, we approach your throne of grace and mercy. We thank you so much, dear Lord, for Jesus. We thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand this very complex and uh, time-consuming uh, subject. But we pray, Lord, that you help us witness to others about it and keep your, your health message, we pray. Please keep us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank, thank you.